not enough. Not enough hand to you. How is everyone? Okay. Very quiet this morning. It's great to be together. Uh, and it is exciting, as Karan said, to be uh, working in partnership with the, the Selvos for this time. We've actually had another meeting this week with uh, pastors from all denominations uh, across Burundara. And it's really exciting to see the way that God is stirring the church, not to just to be our church, but to be the church in, in this city uh, and to work together on mission and to pray and support each other. And so it's a really exciting season um, in what is a challenging season for many, isn't it? With uh, colds and flus and all sorts going around. I um, wanted to share this morning some sad news. Uh, many of you would know and love Rosemary Warboys. Uh, Rosemary passed away on Friday. Um, she's been battling with cancer since uh, uh, the end of last year um, and she went to be with the Lord peacefully. Rosemary, as many would know, has uh, been in this church for a number of years, was a huge part of our English classes that happened on, her, on Saturday morning. Her and John uh, started those uh, in 2010, I'm pretty sure, or nine. Um, and Rosemary is one of those beautiful people that never had a bad word to say, but had a, a beautiful, uh, gentle um, and wise faith in Jesus. And I know many of us would have been encouraged and we will miss her deeply. Uh, and I trust that you would be in prayer for her family. Uh, the service, the Thanksgiving service, will be 2 o'clock here on Monday the 4th of July, uh, Independence Day, the day <laughs> we'll celebrate her returning to be with her Saviour. Uh, so if you would like to be a part, we would love to, to have you here to celebrate with us Rosemary's life, and her legacy, and the way she will continue to live on in our hearts. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, the joy it is to know you, to love you, and to worship you as our God. God, and we thank you for the wonderful example of so many people, but we thank you this morning for the life of Rosemary. God, we thank you for her incredible faith. We thank you for her heart to reach out beyond the walls of the church. We thank you for the many ways that she has loved and she has served us throughout the years. Uh, the ways that she has encouraged us to press closer, to journey more deeply uh, with you, our Lord and our Saviour. God, we pray that you would surround her family at this time. That they would know you as you promise, as the God of all comfort. And that you would instill within them a peace and you would remind them of the hope that held Rosemary steadfast until her last moments. The hope that she will be in heaven with her saviour, Jesus. God, we thank you that that hope is now real for her. And we pray that you will continue to, to guide us into that hope as we remember and give thanks and as we cry and weep and, and uh, mourn the loss of Rosemary. This morning, God, we pray that you would speak to us through your word, that you would uh, just open our hearts, you would allow us to hear not my words, but the words of your spirit, that you would speak to us, you would challenge us, you would change us, that we might live for you in the everyday. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. As we get underway this morning, I want to introduce you to a man, a man that is known and, and loved and respected around the world for his commitment to peace and reconciliation, his commitment to the rights of children. He is uh, South Africa's first democratically erected, elected president, Nelson Mandela. If you don't know Nelson Mandela's story, it's been a person that I've followed and has intrigued me for many, many years. He was born the 18th of July, 1918, to the chief, a chief of a village, uh, Chief Henry Mandela of the Madiba clan. And so he was born into royal family. He was born into a royal family, but he's, after his father's death at the age of 12, Mandela chose to renounce his claim to royalty and to take up study at university. His hope and his dream was to become a, a, a lawyer and make a contribution to the freedom of his people. As a young man, he engaged throughout the uni campus on a number of peaceful protests. One of them actually saw him uh, removed, uh, expelled from the university. 
And yet he continued on this journey of opposing apartheid and, and established South Africa's first law firm uh, dealing with the injustices caused to his people. After a, a massacre, the massacre of uh, 70 or 69 unarmed black South Africans as police opened fire on a demonstration uh, and banned uh, the, the gathering of the National Congress, uh, Mandela abandoned his uh, non-violent stance and began advocating acts of sabotage against the South African regime. After a season where he was known as the Black Pimpernel for his ability to evade capture, on the 5th of August 1962, he was arrested and sentenced to five years in prison. As a result of his trial, Nelson Mandela, as many would know, uh, narrowly escaped the death penalty and was sentenced to life imprisonment for sabotage and treason. And his time in prison, his time in prison changed him in incredible ways. Not so much his passion to stand up against the injustices that were being committed against his people, but his return to a non-violent stance, seeking ways, new and, and non-violent ways to influence and shape the world around him. Until in his famous speech by the docs, he uttered these incredible words. During my lifetime, he said, I've dedicated myself to the struggle of the African people. I've fought against white domination. I've fought against black domination. I've cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal for which I hope to live and see realised. But my Lord, if it needs to be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Incredible words for an incredible man. And it took a long time. Nelson Mandela, as many would know, went through incredible hardships, spent an enormous amount of time in prison. And yet God used every experience to shape him, to shape his life, to shape his character, to shape his faith, to shape a willingness to, to live and die for the mission of God, for the freedom of his people. And it strikes me as a reflection of what we see happening here in the book of Exodus as we meet this young man, Moses who God is preparing. God is preparing to be the, the leader, the deliverer for his people, the one who would lead them into freedom, out of slavery and into freedom. Now, if you missed, uh, last week was the start of our series in the book of Exodus. It is a five-part series uh, in the Pentateuch. Not that our Exodus series will be a five-part, because that will go a very long time. But it's part of a five-part series, the first five books of the Bible. And at the end of Genesis, everything is working out for the people of God. Uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph with his technicolour dream coat, uh, landed in Egypt, although he had lost his coat, has, had been appointed a prime minister. And finally... As a result of this incredible famine, his father Jacob, who would later become known as Israel, and all 70 of his family arrive in Egypt to join him. And so this is the beginning, in many senses, of, uh, of Jacob's family, his tribe, the nation of Israel in Egypt under the leadership of his son Joseph. And even in a foreign land, the people of God had prospered. They had become exceedingly strong. Their numbers are growing rapidly, so much so that the king, the pharaoh, decides he needs to do something about it. It's been 400 years at this time since Joseph died. And so the pharaoh, who has forgotten Joseph's life, his leadership in the nation and his impact throughout Egypt begins to impress and enslave the people of God. And in their sickening move to kill off the newborn children, the sons of God. His plan to, is to reduce their numbers, kill off any potential leaders and warriors and bring them to their knees. And so everything at this point looks hopeless for the people of God. The people of God look helpless and yet there is more going on, as we said, than meets the eye. Because of that courage and conviction, these two midwives, two ordinary working women, Shipra and Pua, who feared God and chose to defy the orders of the king, many sons of God were saved. And through this, God is about to raise up a leader, his deliverer, the one who will release and free his people from slavery. And that is where we pick things up this morning. Pharaoh has established a new law. 
that any son born to Hebrew parents must be thrown into the Nile, must be left to drown. So even though Moses himself enters this world under the threat of death, by God's grace, we see it in scene one, his life is preserved. Moses' life is saved. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Notice what happens, parent, uh, Joseph, uh, Moses' parents, Amran and Jochebed, from the tribe of Levi. They were part of the priestly tradition of God's people. They were people who served in the tabernacle on behalf of the nation of Israel. And so this godly couple have this beautiful baby, which more than handsome is described by this same word God uses in the creation story, good. This baby is good. He is special, he is beautiful, he is a part of God's purposes. And so his parents, or at least his mother's intuition, it seems, is to save him. And so with great courage, he hides him away. As many of you would know, having a newborn is one of the toughest experiences in life. Toughest things you can do, and yet to do it in secret. Can you imagine how hard this must have been? For nine months, she has had to hide her pregnancy. She's given birth without any medical intervention other than her husband, who if he's anything like me in medical things would be more of a hindrance than a help. And then she spends the next three months hiding her newborn baby her pride and her joy away from the world. Thinking back to the, the first couple of months with Kayla, it was a, an amazing time in many ways. We had this new little baby we wanted to introduce to the world. And, and sometimes I think that was what made the long and the sleepless nights bearable because in the first three months, as many would know, all they do and all she did was eat, sleep on some occasions for about 40 minutes if we were lucky and then cry. Things were really tough, and, and so we actually got sent to sleep school. I'm not sure they had sleep school in uh, Moses' day. We were sent to sleep school for a week, and we were so delirious, I think we would have happily slept for a week, but not Kayla. They tried everything they could think of, and nothing seemed to work. And so we left Kayla and went home. Not really. <laughs> Although I think we might have been tempted at some times, a moment of weakness. For three months, this mother kept Moses safe. No visitors, no celebration of his milestones, concerned every cry would give them away. Until verse 3, when they could, she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch, and placed the child in it, and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Her sister stood at a distance, his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen. I think we just lost a light, did we? <laughs> um, unlike many helicopter and lawnmower parents his mother is a, a woman of incredible faith as she places her son into this intricately shaped basket which uh, is the same word used of Noah's ark and so Moses is set on this huge river the river Nile in this small ark until we read verse 5 Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket in the reeds and sent her slave, her female slave, to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Do you see the irony in this moment? This incredible sense of God's sovereignty where everything that, that Pharaoh has tried to achieve backfires in his face, a little like uh, Roadrunner and Coyote, as his daughter of all people, finds this baby. And unlike her father, chooses to show mercy. Names his child. She is saved out of the water. And in the end gets his mum to nurse him. It's incredible, isn't it? It's incredible how often God takes these terrible, uh, horrible situations and uses them to bring about his purposes. I mean, Jochebed gives up a son. She releases him into the hands of God. And what does God do? He saves him. He restores him into the arms of his mother who gets to raise her son, but this time with the help of a Centrelink allowance directly from Pharaoh's home. 
until finally he moves into the palace. You can almost imagine this incredible contrast, can't you? On one hand, Moses has grown up with his mum. Hearing the stories about God's people, hearing of God's promises to Israel, hearing about the sacrifice they had made and the way God had saved him from the river, had saved him for a purpose. But then as he uh, turns up in the palace, as the prince of Egypt, he is given position, he is given power, he had received a quality education, he was surrounded by wealth and possessions and all the opportunities that gave him. As a result of this safe, comfortable uh, existence he enjoyed in the palace, we find Moses torn. Moses torn between his two identities, a little like a, a superhero stuck with their alter ego. And so the question is, who is he? Who will he be? Who are his people and how we engage with the world around him? Will he choose to live as a slave to the king or as a son of God? So I was thinking in many senses the, the privileged upbringing of Moses uh, reflects something of our own experience. Like Moses, we live in these incredible homes. We get to study at the best of universities. We have safety and security. We buy anything we want. We have more than we need. And sometimes, if you're anything like me, we find ourselves so caught up in the, the patterns and the problems of this world, we start to forget who we are, who we belong to. The sacrifice that has been made to save us from our sins and our, our souls and from the patterns of this world. The reality is we have been bought at a price. We have been given a new identity. Jesus has saved us and given us a life in him. And like Moses, we have a decision to make. We stand as the sons of God, the sons and daughters of God, or we live as slaves to this world. So easy to forget who we are. So easy to forget who we belong to. So easy to, to forget what it means to live as the sons of God and fall back into the patterns of this world. And as that is where we find ourselves this morning, the invitation is to sit. To sit and reflect and to recapture the reality and the, the beauty, the necessity of the cross. Because only a true understanding, a true appreciation of the cross will keep us grounded in our affections and our obedience to Jesus. We see God's intervention. We see his preservation, his saving hand on the life of Moses. And it stirs this glimmer of hope among the people of God that, that just maybe God would maybe use this child to save his people, to bring them out of Egypt, to, to lead them into the promised land where they can freely worship him again. And Moses chooses. He chooses to stand with his peoples, to stand against the oppression of Pharaoh, but for Moses to become the leader, the deliverer of God's people, he needs to go some faith and character development. Which brings us to this second scene, the preparation of Moses. As we pick up this second scene, uh, it skips forward a number of years, and now Moses is an adult. In fact, if, we, if you look at Acts chapter 7, we learn that Moses is 40 years old. He is still living at home in the palace of Pharaoh as the prince of Egypt. When he starts to venture out among the people of God. As there we find one day in verse 11 that after Moses had grown up, he went out where the people were and watched them. At their hard labor, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Moses sees the abuse. He steps in and it says, looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now, it's interesting to note, isn't it, that Moses calls the Israelites his own people. He calls the Israelites his own people, maybe because he was raised in a Hebrew home. Maybe it's a blessing of hindsight. Maybe it was something about the oppression of the Israelites, uh, the, the Egyptian slave masters that caused his heart to go out for his people. Either way, the next day it says he goes out again. He says, see two Hebrews fighting and he asks the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew or companion is the other translation. 
In this unexpected turn, the man looked at, at Moses, the prince of Egypt, and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Must have been a horrible moment, mustn't it, for Moses? In this moment, he realizes his sins are forgiven, that his sins had been exposed. It's only a matter of time until Pharaoh finds out, and so he flees. He frees from Egypt, and verse 15, we find him alone and desolate by a well in Midian. In just a couple of days, Moses has lost everything. He was the prince of Egypt, and now he's hated by everyone, rejected by his own people, hunted by his adoptive father in Pharaoh. He is a fugitive on the run with an incredible history, and yet with nothing, with nowhere, with no one to support him. And yet everything is about to change. Thanks to God's grace and maybe a little overconfidence on his part, everything is about to change for Moses. Sitting by the well and these women, as we read, came to draw water. As usual, they're being harassed by some of the, the, the local shepherds, driven away from the, the well until Moses steps in in this act of unparalleled chivalry. Moses decides to take on these rogue shepherds. And like any true hero who takes a stand, he saves the day and he waters their flocks for them. In this generous action. The women arrive home early. Tell their father, the priest of Midian, about this man at the well. And he's thinking, man, this guy, this guy is a keeper. What, what are you doing? Go and get him. Bring him home. Introduce him to your mother. And verse 21, it says, Moses agreed to stay. He agreed to stay with the man who gave him his daughter, Zipporah, to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershon, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. It's interesting, isn't it? Moses had landed on his feet. And yet in a name where, uh, a society where names carry incredible meaning, the naming of his son seems to have this deeper awareness and humility. And maybe that's exactly what God needed in this moment, for, for Moses to become all he could be. See, Moses has lost everything. He's lost his family, his people, his home. And yet, even in this foreign land, God has been faithful. He has been faithful to his promises. He blesses Moses with a, a new home, a new job, a family to call his own. And all this begins to change his heart, to develop his character, to prepare him to become the person, the leader, the deliverer that God needed for his people. Don't get me wrong, Moses has always had this incredible heart, this insatiable desire to stand against injustice, a willingness to stand for the people of God. The problem is how he went about it. Moses had adopted the patterns of Egypt. In a sense, this sense of entitlement that caused him to judge, to take matters into his own hands and to kill this Egyptian slave master. Uh, Tim suggests, uh, uh, Chester, a theologian, suggests that Moses ends up behaving more like an Egyptian slave master than a child of God. And needs to relearn the ways of God and his people. An incredible statement, isn't it? Moses, in his good intentions, has become more like a slave master than one of God's chosen people. And I think it's one of the challenges we need to wrestle with today. The reality is we have become so accustomed to Christendom, to creating these uh, us and them mindsets that allows us to judge, to enforce the rules, to take matters into our own hands. And yet, like Moses, God wants to change us. He wants to change the church. He wants to shape our faith and our character for a new season, a new season of mission. And if you ask me, that's what these past couple of years have been about. It's not about a pandemic. It's not about vax or anti-vax. It's not even about God's judgment. Although this is clearly a result of sin and brokenness. But if you ask me, if you scratch below the surface of this pandemic, it has been about God. God humbling his people. God taking on us, uh, us on a journey to deepen our faith, to develop our character, to help us become more and more like Jesus. 
Some of you might, if you were here last week, might remember what Ian shared at the end of the service. He said the, the real challenge wasn't God getting his people out of Egypt. It was getting Egypt out of his people. It took 40 years in the wilderness. I think this is part of the challenge for us. And for the church to start to unlearn the patterns of this world that have become so normal and acceptable. Because we cannot do the work of God in worldly ways. We cannot achieve uh, God's purpose without the help of his spirit. We, we cannot become the people and the leaders, the messengers of God's promises unless we can become like Jesus in our thoughts, our attitudes and actions. Not that we become perfect people by any means. But that we choose to follow Jesus. To allow him to shape us and, and to lead us and, and to grow us and equip us. At every turn. Like Moses, we have been saved. We have been saved through the sacrifice of Jesus. We have been saved for a purpose that is greater than ourselves. And God, by his grace, will use everything. He will use our strengths and our shortcomings, our interactions. He will use even the situations we land ourselves in sometimes to grow our faith and our character and our dependence on him. That we see throughout the book of Mo- uh, the book of Exodus, that we see in the life of Moses, God saves Moses and leads him into the wilderness, not just like Jesus in his temptation, to develop his character, to deepen his faith. And as he does, he does it with a purpose, so he can raise him up to deliver his people. It's interesting to note that it wasn't a quick fix, was it? If you take a look at verse 23, it says, During that long period, that period between Moses leaving Egypt and Moses being called by God. If you go to Acts 7 again, when Stephen is being stoned, we learn that it's 40 years. It's 40 years that, that Moses spends in Egypt. It's 40 years that he spends in a medium for faith and character development. And while it's all happening to the people While it's all happening, we see what is happening to the people of God. In verse 23, it says, During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites. And was concerned. He was concerned about them. It's moments like this, isn't it? Moments like we find with the Israelites here. Moments when we find ourselves feeling alone, abandoned by God, like our world is falling apart, that we start to question and to doubt and, and even to turn our backs on God. Where are you? How could you? I trusted you. How could you allow this to happen? I know, I've been there before. And my guess is that at times in our lives, most of us have asked those questions. Some of us have maybe been asking them throughout COVID, and it's important to know the answer. For we find ourselves in these situations that help us. There are three things I want us to notice about God's response to his people. Three things in this moment. It says that God remembered, that God saw, and that God knew. Often when we talk about remember, we have this nostalgic sense, don't we? Do you remember when we did this or when this happened? But to remember here means that God was fully aware. He was fully aware of his people. He was mindful of his promises. He was making preparations to follow through. God is preparing to take the next step in his plan to save his people, to free them from slavery because he sees them. God sees us. He sees our sin and our brokenness. He sees our enslavement to the passions and the patterns of this world and has come to meet us where we are because he knows, like Israel. God knows us intimately. He holds us in his heart. And by his grace, he has set in motion a plan to purchase us back, to restore our freedom, to lead us to a place where we can worship and serve him with the whole of our lives. So the story of Moses is this wonderful reminder. It's a wonderful reminder that God knows us. He 
He sees us. He remembers his promises. And he will be faithful not only to his people but to his promises and and his purposes. In fact, that's what sets the tone, isn't it, for the rest of the book of Exodus. That is what sets the tone for the rest of the New Testament. That is what reflects uh, the good news we see demonstrated in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Right at the heart of the gospel is this promise. This promise that even in our darkest moments when everything seems to be falling apart, when we find ourselves enslaved and struggling with the patterns and passions of this world, The good news, there is good news that God knows us. He sees us. And in Jesus, he has sent a redeemer. One who has given up his throne in heaven. One who would sacrifice his life on earth to save us from our souls and from our sin. To purchase for us a freedom so we can live for him and with him. Yet how often do we settle How often do we settle for the patterns of this world? How often do we slip back into our comfort zone? Settle for this uh, safe, middle-class Christianity? Do you know God sees you? He knows you. He remembers his promises. The promises that find their yes and amen in Jesus. Not only does he want to save us. Not only does he gather us to himself through the sacrifice of Jesus. But he wants to invite us into places. Sometimes dark and and difficult and, and sometimes places that feel a little desolate, but places where he can begin to develop our faith and, and deepen our character, the character of Jesus in us, knowing that as he promised, he will work everything together for our good, for the good of all people, and for the fulfillment of his promises. Jesus saves us. He wants to to grow our faith, to develop our character. And he wants to lead us into this world. He wants to use us in this world to bring the hope and the help of Jesus to all those around us. We have been saved with a purpose. And my prayer is that God will continue to shape us individually and he would lead us as a church. He would empower us by his spirit. That like Moses, we might stand in the gap and hold out the hope of Jesus, saving grace of Jesus. And lead us into his promises. That we might truly love and and serve and, and worship him. As we go about our lives in a fallen and broken world. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the incredible story of Moses. God, we thank you that it reminds us of all the the, the good things we have in Jesus, that you are the God who has come to meet us where we are, that you are the, the God who saves us in the midst of our brokenness, that you are the God who grows us and shapes us. That we might lead your people, that we might love our community, that we might extend the, the grace and the, the goodness of God into the spaces where life can be hard, where there is an attraction and enslavement to the things of this world. God, we pray that as we journey forward, that like Moses, we would have a deep and and abiding understanding and appreciation of the sacrifice that has been made through Jesus, the sacrifice that has been made to redeem us, 
the sacrifice that has been made that we might grow into his image and live for his purpose. God, continue to shape us. Continue to grow our faith, to shape our character, that we might be used for your purpose, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.